What are the new 2023 gold guidelines on the management of COPD? Is albuterol still our default rescue inhaler for the management of asthma? And as hospitalists, should we be starting patients with COPD on things like chronic azithromycin and reflumilast? First thing to really notice, what we always have to look for is a potential trigger. And for asthma, some typical things you may hear are, you know, exposure to cold can cause an asthma flare or exercise. You can get exercise induced asthma. And then of course, you know, viral URIs is very common as well. In COPD, very often it's going to be a viral URI, but there's actually a lot of literature that states that up to 30% of COPD exacerbations may be triggered by PEs. And so this is obviously something you do not want to miss. You don't want to just have somebody come in for a COPD exacerbation, treat them and never work them up for a potential PE, you know, when no other trigger is, is found. So in terms of treatment, it's fairly standard. Um, so bronchodilators is really our first line. So we're going to start with duonebs and you can start off Q1 hour, Q2 hour for the first several doses. And then generally we start to space them out to Q4 hours uh, scheduled, and then you switch them to PRN. We also are going to start patients on prednisone, and the most common dose is going to be 40 milligrams, and the duration is going to be for five days. Now, uh, in the past, they used to treat patients for like 14 days or even a month with steroids, but there was actually this really important tri trial called the REDUCE trial, which compared five days versus 14 days of prednisone and found that uh, a five-day course was non-inferior to the prolonged courses. Another common PIMP question that attendings may ask you is, is there any benefit to IV solumedrol or IV methylprednisolone in the upfront treatment of COPD? And uh, definitely if the patient is unable to tolerate oral intake, that's something we're going to consider, or if it's a very, very severe uh, COPD exacerbation. But in general, the evidence has not shown any advantage to using IV steroids compared to oral steroids. And then afterwards, you're going to give them oxygen as needed uh, for a goal SAT of 88 to 92%. The reason we only target a goal of 88 to 92 percent is also a very common question. And you may have been told that this is because high levels of oxygen will reduce the respiratory drive in patients with COPD, but this is actually not the primary reason for uh, avoiding high oxygen in these patients. It's actually due to a uh, reversal of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So imagine you have the patient's lungs right here, and there are areas of the lungs that are uh, having significant air trapping and very poor air movement. So let's say all of this is kind of knocked out. What your uh, pulmonary vessels are actually going to do is they are actually going to start increasing the blood flow to the areas with better oxygenation. And then these places with worse oxygenation, they're going to start vasoconstricting. So they'll start narrowing these vessels down like this. Now, what you do when you give them really high oxygen, let's say um, the patient is suddenly satting 100%, what happens is this area now has adequate oxygenation, but it still hasn't reversed the air trapping that's been going on here. So all of a sudden, the uh, you know pulmonary vessels going up here are going to start dilating because it's like, oh, we have good oxygen here now. So this is going to dilate. And the problem is there's actually still no gas exchange going on here because uh, of the air trapping. And that subsequently, you're going to start vasoconstricting these ones that were actually getting good oxygen before. So that's the whole concept of not giving them too much, too much oxygen because you would potentially reverse the hypoxemic pulmonary vasoconstriction. The next treatment to consider in both asthma and COPD is actually IV magnesium. And then regarding antibiotics, how do you make that determination on whether a patient should be started on azithromycin or not? Obviously, azithromycin, not, not only to treat, you know, atypical pneumonias and things like that, but also because it's thought to have its own anti-inflammatory effect as well. So what you should determine is if they have increased sputum, increased cough, or increased dyspnea. If you meet two out of three of these, then you can start uh, azithromycin. 500 milligrams for three days, or you can do 500 milligrams and then 250 milligrams times five days. That is the basic approach to the management of an acute exacerbation of asthma or COPD. Now let's talk about maintenance. 
And I really had a great um, attending once tell me a very easy way to remember the escalation of treatment that, and the way that it differs between asthma and COPD. So what you have is a, a whole host of different inhalers. And so we're going to start with ICS or inhaled corticosteroids. And then we are going to progress to a long acting beta agonist like formoterol or salmeterol. And then we're going to progress to a long acting muscarinic antagonist. So this is a progression of inhalers for uh, the treatment of asthma. So if you're thinking asthma, then this is the direction that you would be going. For COPD, it's actually the exact opposite. Uh, and so for COPD, we're going to go this way. We're going to start with the long acting muscarinic antagonist, add the long acting beta agonist, and then add the ICS on top of that. So how do you know when to escalate therapy uh, in a patient with asthma? So what you really want to pay attention to is the rule of twos. And the rule of twos is that you want your patients to be using their rescue inhaler less than two times a week, and they should be having less than two times a month of nocturnal symptoms. If your patient is using their rescue inhaler more frequently than that, or having nocturnal symptoms more than twice a month, then the patient should be um, stepped up in terms of their therapy. Let's talk about the rescue inhaler now. So all of these patients should actually be on a rescue inhaler. So they've got these maintenance inhalers on the right side, which they take every day, um, no matter what, to just kind of keep the inflammation at bay. But if they're starting to feel a flare up, then they're gonna use their rescue inhaler. And so previously, our rescue inhaler of choice was a short acting beta agonist, uh, also known as albuterol. However, if you actually look at the updated 2019 GINA recommendations or the Global Initiative for the Treatment of Asthma, you can actually see that the preferred reliever is now as needed low dose ICS plus formoterol. So it's ICS plus ALABA, uh, which is very interesting. And you can see the other reliever option is a short acting beta agonist such as albuterol, but the preferred reliever again is now an ICS plus LABA combination. So therefore, change your association of albuterol as being the rescue inhaler for uh, asthma to being that of an ICS plus formoterol or uh, ICS plus LABA. For COPD, however, it is still typically going to be a short-acting beta agonist. And then finally, one last thing I wanted to mention for asthma is that there's a few adjunctive therapies. Uh, for example, if somebody has allergies, you may want to consider something like Montelukast or Singular. And also if they have an elevated IgE, uh, this would probably be done by the pulmonologist, but they may qualify for something called uh, omalizumab. Now let's move back to COPD. So uh, one of the common things that we actually ask in COPD is what are treatments that actually have mortality benefit? You know, does being on all of these inhalers provide mortality benefit? Or are there only a few uh, treatments that actually have been proven to have mortality benefit? And so the things that are shown to have mortality benefit is going to be Number one, it's going to be smoking cessation. Number two is going to be oxygen therapy for patients who have persistent hypoxemia, uh, satting less than 88%. And then number three is going to be lung volume reduction surgery, which can be done surgically or the interventional pulmonologists actually have uh, a technique called endo endobronchial valve placement, which basically in these surgeries, they are collapsing the most diseased parts of the lung so that it kind of allows the healthier lung to expand more and be able to participate more in gas exchange. And so that's how that's been shown to uh, improve mortality in patients with COPD. Other things that you really should consider, um, basically every patient with COPD uh, would benefit from pulmonary rehab, which has been shown to improve six minute walk time and quality of life metrics. And then also if they have a really elevated, uh, what we call a BODE score, so very, very severe um, COPD, uh, then we would consider something like referring them to a lung transplant center. But I want you to remember, these are the three things that really have been shown to have mortality benefit. Smoking cessation, oxygen, and lung volume reduction surgery. All of these other uh, treatments, inhalers, and everything like that improves the quality of life, but does not have an actual mortality benefit. So now that we've talked about the treatment and the maintenance of COPD and asthma, why don't we actually talk 
briefly about the pathophysiology and then also uh, diagnosis and how you actually make a official diagnosis. So the pathophysiology is very interesting. Um, and I would say that for asthma, you know, what you really can think of is you've got your airway and then you've got your uh, alveoli with all these little tiny alveolar sacs here. And in asthma, what you get is hypertrophy or inflammation of the airway smooth muscle, right? So this is all going to start getting inflamed, whether it's due to an irrit irritant or some other um, kind of hypersensitivity of the airway smooth muscle, and that's going to lead to airway obstruction. So again, all of these are leading to airway obstruction. The key thing with asthma is that this airway obstruction responds to bronchodilators. So uh, when you give them a bronchodilator, you're going to reduce that airway smooth muscle inflammation, and that's going to relieve the obstruction. So they do have a positive bronchodilator response. On the other hand, when you have COPD, you've got, again, your airway here, and you've got your alveolar sacs, and you've got the alveoli here. Um, but what happens is, you know, COPD is typically associated with you know, long-term exposure to toxins like cigarette smoking being the major one. And this leads to elastin breakdown. Uh, and basically what happens is all of your uh, air sacs become really loose and floppy. And so, you know, imagine, uh, you know, Dr. Sitar said it the best in uh, Pathoma, but imagine these uh, over here in the asthma patient or the normal lung are kind of like tight balloons. And so when you want to get rid of that, um, you know, air from them, it's a balloon, right? It's got a lot of tension and it's going to just let that air uh, go out of the body. But when you have uh, really dilated um, air sacs that are just floppy, it's basically like a grocery bag. And if you let go of a grocery bag, you know, there's still a bunch of air in it. It doesn't push the air out or anything. So all this air just ends up functionally becoming trapped. Uh, not only that, but you also get a destruction of the cartilage in your airways. And so this can lead to airway collapse. So now all of a sudden you're getting collapse of the airways uh, whenever there's like too much pressure. And that, uh, un unlike the smooth muscle inflammation of uh, asthma, is not responsive to bronchodilators. So no bronchodilator response. So now let's talk about diagnosis. And this, of course, is going to rely predominantly on your PFTs. So first we're going to talk about asthma. And then we're going to talk about COPD. So with asthma, it's really quite simple. And basically what I said uh, earlier, we're looking for signs of obstruction with a bronchodilator response. So how do we actually determine if there's a bronchodilator response? So basically you do the PFTs before giving them a bronchodilator, then you give them the albuterol, and then you repeat the PFTs. And what you're looking for is an increase in their FEV1 greater than 12% or an increase in their tidal volume by greater than 200. The other thing you should know is, you know, what if a patient's not in an acute asthma exacerbation, how can you actually induce them to get kind of this obstructive picture so you can actually run this test? Uh, well, that's when we would run something called a methacholine challenge, which is basically giving them a very, uh, a very strong irritant to induce an asthma exacerbation, and then you'll get the PFT measurements, and then you'll give them the bronchodilator to check for bronchodilator response. COPD, on the other hand, is really going to be defined by looking at the FEV1 over FEC ratio of greater of less than 0.7. So anytime you have a patient with COPD, you really want to make sure that they have actual documented PFTs showing this ratio because uh, there's a lot of times people are just given the label of COPD, but they don't actually have a formal diagnosis. And then after that, we have various levels of gold staging. So first of all, we've got one, two, three, and four, and these are based on your FEV1. So for a gold stage one, your FEV1 is less than 80%. For gold stage two, it's 50 to 80%. Gold three is going to be 30 to 50%. And then gold four is going to be less than 30%. In addition to this classification, however, we also have the gold A through E staging. So it goes from A, B, and E. So this is a little confusing because it actually used to be A, B, C, D. And what it uh, helped us do was determine what inhaler regimen a uh, patient should be on. Uh, but recently in the 2023 gold guidelines, this was updated to being A, B, and E. And really how it goes is this. So uh, you've got 
gold E up here and you have A and B. So A and B, you know, these are people with uh, low scores on the MMRC or low CAT scores. These are basically measures of their quality of life. Uh, and then this would be high MMRC or high CAT scores. And then here would be no exacerbations or hospitalizations. And this would be basically many exacerbations. They define it as two plus exacerbations or um, uh, be ever being hospitalized for COPD exacerbation. Okay, so that's how you determine if the patient is gold stage A, B, or E. Okay, and here I've just brought in a image from the gold guidelines. So you can see that group A should be started on a bronchodilator. And remember, you know, our first line is really going to be that long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Group B will qualify for LAMA plus LABA. And then group E will qualify for LAMA plus LABA. And if their blood eosinophils are greater than 300, you should start an inhaled corticosteroid. This is another image from the gold guidelines. And I want you to know that starting an inhaled uh, corticosteroid is not without risks. So patients who have blood eosinophils greater than 300 are the most likely to benefit from starting inhaled corticosteroid. And then if they've ever been hospitalized for COPD or had multiple exacerbations. Now you can consider the use if their eosinophils are 100 to 300. However, they recommend strongly against use if patients have repeated pneumonia, if they have blood eosinophils less than 100, or history of mycobacterial infection. The reason is because inhaled corticosteroids are associated with increased pneumonia events, so it's not without risk, as I mentioned. And if their blood eosinophils are less than 100, they're probably not going to benefit from starting inhaled corticosteroids. Lastly, I also want to talk about the initiation of the medications Roflumilast and Azithromycin. So Roflumilast is like a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and Azithromycin is obviously an antibiotic. And we've actually been getting much better evidence for initiating these therapies in patients who have been hospitalized for COPD. So as hospitalists, the, that begs the question, should we be responsible for starting these medications in you know, frequent COPD exacerbation um, patients? And I would argue that the answer is yes. So if a patient is coming in for an exacerbation, you really, really should strongly consider do they qualify for the medication Roflumilast? And the criteria would include an FEV1 of less than 50% and chronic bronchitis uh, subtype. Or do they qualify for chronic azithromycin, uh, which is usually dosed like 250 milligrams Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or something like that. And this would be highly considered in patients who are former smokers. For the azithromycin, uh, this was actually based on the BASE trial, which showed a 20% reduction in COPD exacerbations. And the main side effects were some mild nausea, QT prolonging, and some uh, mild hearing loss, which was only detected on sensory, neuro sensory ne neural testing and not ever reported by the patients. And then also there was reversal of the hearing loss after they, um, after they stopped the azithromycin. That was a lot of information to throw at you guys, but I actually got a couple more learning points that I wanted to uh, uh, you know, discuss with you guys. So um, should every single patient with COPD be tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? The answer to that is actually yes, per the 2023 gold uh, guidelines. So any patient that you see with COPD and has not been tested before, you should actually test them for it. And then secondly, a very common boards question for you know our medical students uh, taking step two or interns taking step three, a patient, an asthmatic who's coming in uh, diffusely wheezy. They're having like a little bit of respiratory alkalosis because they're breathing so fast. Uh, their PCO2 is kind of low. And then all of a sudden you, you know, start treatment and patient uh, is starting to uh, actually, their PCO2 is starting to normalize. So PCO2 is going back up. It's up to 40. Patient is no longer wheezing. Um, and so you're like, great. Uh, the patient uh, is not wheezing anymore. Their PCO2 is going back to normal. Uh, what is the next best step in management? That's how the board question is going to ask it. And the answer to that is actually going to be intubate. <laughs> so you should intubate this patient. Uh, and they're going to give you in the question that the patient, you know, they're not wheezing anymore, but they still look pretty bad. And they're like out of it. They're like tired, things like that. Uh, and the reason is because uh, this patient is starting to retain CO2. The fact that the CO2 is normalizing is actually a sign that they're tiring out. The lack of wheezing is actually because the patient is now having such poor air movement 
that they can't even generate the sound of wheezing. So that's why they're not wheezing anymore. And so both of these signs together, along with the fact that the patient doesn't look improved, they look somnolent. The answer to this question is that the patient should be intubated. Very, very common boards question, and I can almost guarantee that you're going to get it on one of your board exams. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.